15 minutes for coffee break. And then we go come back uh, uh, half past 11 sharp to two high-rise buildings, one in Qatar and the other one in Korea. Uh, this uh, is a, uh, a diagram produced by the Council for Tall Buildings and the Urban Habitat showing how the uh, rate of increase uh, in high-rise buildings in excess of 150 meters tall has accelerated. And you see prior to the 1970s we had very few high-rise buildings and yet in the decade, uh, in the 2000 decade, uh, we had hundreds and hundreds of these buildings. And I would imagine that the current statistic, even with the global financial crisis, will see the next decade uh, accelerate again in the construction of tall buildings. So we have an ongoing challenge here uh, to design foundations which are safe and economical. We need to understand some of the characteristics of tall buildings. The loads are very high, and as you get higher, the loads actually increase more rapidly than, than the height. Uh, so it's a non-linear increase in height. Uh, we, we have um, often low-rise areas adjacent to our tower. This is podiums with shopping centers. And so they're much uh, more lightly loaded than the towers themselves, and so we have the potential for differential settlements. We have high lateral forces and moments from wind, um, and, and so this creates uh, quite a problem. Um, we have um, cyclic loading, again, you know, due to the wind, and so we need to take that into account. We may have um, uh, dynamic uh, issues uh, related to our foundations and, and we need to design for seismic loadings uh, due to both inertial loading and kinematic loading, that's the, the movement of the ground and its inter interaction on the structures. Um, and um, we have uh, a number of other issues in terms of dynamics and so on. So there are significant uh, number of issues uh, related to tall buildings. If we're going to uh, design foundations um, uh, economically, there are a number of things that we need to do. Firstly, we need to have the right type of foundation. Uh, so we have to have uh, an appropriate foundation concept. We have to use an appropriate design method and design criteria. We need, and this is critical of course, to have appropriate ground data uh, and design parameters. And this is often one of the most critical aspects of foundation design, is getting the parameters. We need to have quality construction. We need to have uh, appropriate foundation element testing. In particular, if we're dealing with deep foundations, we need to do pile load testing. And we should always have uh, during and after construction, performance monitoring so that we understand how well our structure is performing in relation to our design expectations. I think uh, many of you would know that uh, generally when we're dealing with uh, buildings uh, of any size, we have at least three options for foundation systems. We can use a raft, uh, if the building isn't exceedingly tall and the ground conditions are very good, we can use a fully piled system uh, so that all the loads uh, are designed to be carried by the piles. Or we can use a combination of these, a piled draft system, uh, and that in many cases is likely to be the most economical and effective option for many sites. And indeed, the two cases I'll show you are both piled draft foundations technical reduction factors uh, that we apply to our estimated ultimate capacity vertically and laterally and we do an analysis to try and ensure that under these load combinations the weakened foundation system, that is the foundation system uh, that has factored down capacities will not collapse and if that condition is satisfied then 
we basically say the building will stand up. And so that's the requirement, that under these ultimate limit state loads, no collapse will occur. In terms of um, serviceability, fairly straightforward. This is what we've always done. We apply the serviceability uh, load combinations. So these are, of course, generally less than the ultimate limit state. They're like uh, dead load plus some proportion of live load normally. And we use our best estimates of uh, soil resistance and soil stiffness. We don't try and factor the stiffness uh, or resistance of the ground in this type of calculation. In terms of structural design, we actually have to do a separate calculation because it is not correct to factor down your pile capacities when you're doing a structural design analysis. The reason is that if we factor down our capacities and we're limiting the amount of axial load that can come onto the pile and so we may under predict the amount of uh, vertical load that the pile has to be designed for. So what we do now is that we use our unfactored soil resistances in this analysis and we calculate the loads and moments and then we apply a factor onto those calculated moments and loads. Importantly, and this is really critical, we don't work in isolation. We work in conjunction with the structural engineers. Uh, and, and it's important uh, that we recognize that, that we're dealing with an interactive system. What we typically do when we've gone through our analysis is that we will provide for the structural engineer values of the stiffness of each of the piles in the foundation system which they then put into their structural analysis to work out uh, what needs to be done from the point of view of the structure. Um, and, and I think if that's done in the right way, then um, uh, you get a, a very good outcome. Um, one of the things that I emphasize here is that when we provide stiffness values to our structural colleagues, they must account for the interaction among the piles in the group. You can't just take a load test result from a single isolated pile and apply that to a large group of piles because you will get um, a, a result that is far too stiff. And I'll show you an example of this in a moment. In terms of the analyses that we need to do, uh, what are the desirable things? Well, we need to be able to have an analysis which looks at pile groups subjected to um, uh, vertical loads and horizontal loads and moments. We need to be able to handle realistic soil profiles. We need to be able to incorporate nonlinear uh, soil pile behavior. We need, ideally, to be able to handle different pile types within a group because in modern design, we don't have to use the same length diameter of pile uh, as perhaps we've done in the past. We can be more sophisticated than that. We need to be able to incorporate the stiffness of the, the raft um, and, um, uh, and the stiffness of the structure. So all of these things are desirable. There's a number of uh, programs that are around that uh, we use or, or can use. These three are commercially available. This is a program I developed over 30 years ago, so it's an old one. Uh, this is Professor Randolph's Piglet program. This is an updated version, Repute, which is now commercially available in the UK. All of these are pile group analysis programs. They all have similar abilities, give or take. We use these as a routine design tool when we're trying to come up with the optimum foundation system. What we then do is that we'll use one of these more sophisticated uh, tools like uh, Plaxus 2 and 3D or Abacus uh, or uh, the FLAC 2 and 3D and there are of course other 2 and 3 dimensional programs. We will use those programs uh, in the final stages of design to make sure 
that the system that we've come up with uh, performs as uh, we think it, it uh, will according to these uh, more simple programs. In our company, we have a number of other programs, and I'll just mention these very quickly because I'll show you one or two results. Uh, but, but these are programs that we've developed internally to do file groups, uh, two of these, um, and uh, one that uh, deals with the settlement analysis of file graphs. I should say that there is no single program uh, that is not a finite element program that can provide everything we would like to have. There are always limitations on any of these programs. And if you really want the, the ultimate in versatility, then you have to go to the prolonged process of a three-dimensional finite element analysis. In the written paper, I've just shown uh, an example, a very simple example, before we get on to reality, of a square raft with nine or 15 piles. And what I've done there is I've just run through uh, analyses to check uh, the 9 and 15 pile raft uh, uh, solutions to that problem. And without going into detail, uh, we find here that for both of those foundations, the ultimate limit state condition is satisfied. This is when we reduce the pile capacities and we put on all the loads, um, it stays up. However, the one thing that is not satisfied with the nine pile group is the cyclic load criteria. We find that with the um, cyclic wind loads that we've specified in this problem, that the cyclic axial load exceeds half the ultimate skin friction. Uh, serviceability uh, is fine, the settlements are not that different. Um, we have uh, relatively small differences uh, in the other uh, characteristics of behavior. So um, in this particular case, um, everything is fine for the nine pile group except for the amount of cyclic loading that it would have to resist. Now, uh, just uh, before I go on to real examples, um, just to point out that there are in fact, if we're dealing with pile draft systems, there are four sets of interactions which any good analysis should consider. There's the interaction between one part of the raft and another. There's the interaction between one pile and another. There's the interaction between a pile and a raft, and the interaction between the raft and the pile. So there are four interactions uh, that we need to consider in a complete analysis. For the uh, case, the simple case I showed you previously, this uh, little diagram just shows the axial stiffness of the foundation that we calculate for three cases. The first one is where we take into account all the interactions. The second is where we consider only the interaction between the piles. And the third is where we ignore all the interactions. This is for the nine piles, this is for the 15 piles. And without going into too much detail, if you ignore all the interactions, you will get a stiffness that is three to four times higher than the real value. In other words, you will underpredict the settlements by a factor of three or four if you ignore the interactions. So it's absolutely critical in foundation design for tall buildings that you take account of these interactions. The other thing that, of course, we have to do, and I don't have time to go into detail, is we need to make assessments of the key parameters. The ultimate shaft friction, the ultimate end bearing, the soil stiffness for vertical loading, both for long-term, if we're dealing with long-term settlements, and also for short-term loading, because we might be concerned about the movement of the foundation under wind or seismic loading. We need to look at ultimate lateral pressures to, to see whether there's uh, any lateral problems, and uh, the stiffness that we use uh, under lateral loading may well be different from that under vertical loading. And if we're dealing with dynamic loadings, uh, then we need to address the issue of dynamic parameters. Uh, another absolutely critical issue, and, and one that uh, I think is almost universally adopted now, 
you know, with tall buildings, is that we need to be able to do pile load tests uh, to test our design uh, and, and to make sure uh, that uh, everything is as we expect. And in many cases, uh, we've found that our design assumptions are conservative, so we can in fact either reduce the number or size of the parts. And I've just indicated here that uh, uh, the Osterberg cell test, which I think some of you may be familiar with, uh, is turning out to be a very effective form of testing. Uh, it has actually been used here in Vietnam. It was used for the, uh, the Mekong River Bridge down near Ho Chi Minh City some years ago. And um, it, it's a very convenient form of test. Now, to the first of the two cases I want to consider, and quite briefly, I, I, time is not going to permit me to say too much about these, but uh, this is a 435 metre building in Doha, in Qatar, and this is what uh, hopefully it will look like one of these days. Um, the foundation layout is shown here. There's uh, very heavy loadings in the middle here. Um, and the ground profile is, is rather interesting because unlike many other profiles, uh, you get the good ground conditions up here and the poor ground conditions down here. And we have uh, a very poor limestone uh, or chalk deposit uh, that extends uh, from about 40 or 50 metres below the ground surface down to about 120 metres. So if you want end bearing piles, you're out of luck unless you're prepared to have 120 metre long piles, which we weren't in this particular case. So this is a situation where clearly we make use of this uh, good limestone, there's some Sema limestone near the surface. Uh, we put the raft on that and then we add to that piles to uh, increase the capacity and the stiffness of the system. Uh, these are the foundation loads. I won't spend too much time on those, but uh, they're, they're quite significant uh, loads. Uh, uh, vertical loads in excess of 3,000 meganewtons uh, and quite large lateral loads and moments. The foundation system consisted of 232 uh, piles, one and a half metres diameter, and only up to 32 metres long. So they weren't particularly long. This is below the base of the raft. The raft itself was not very thick. Uh, these days, 2.5 metre thick, uh, but it was founded in uh, that uh, better upper layer. And uh, as I said, the properties of the, the rust chalk uh, that the bad layer do not really improve with depth. Um, these are the, the outcomes of our overall stability analysis and when we do these stability analyses and we do it with our program called CLAP, we have a whole series of load combinations which we examine. We apply reduction factors to our estimated axial and lateral capacities and we see if the system is stable or not. And for all of these um, uh, system, the, the eight load combinations, it was stable. Uh, the settlements that we calculate are not very meaningful because they're all non-linear. But um, it, it showed that that foundation system was stable. This is the check for cyclic loading. These, uh, on the horizontal axis, we have the each of the 220 uh, I've passed 232 piles with the cyclic load component as a proportion of the ultimate shaft friction. And we try and keep that uh, proportion to a half and we just managed to make it here with some of the extreme piles. So this system then satisfied our cyclic loading criterion. We then went through a settlement analysis uh, using uh, uh, our internal uh, program called GARP, Geotechnical Analysis of Raft with Piles. And um, this is the sort of thing that we get out of this, uh, just contours of settlement. Maximum settlement's quite large and uh, well in excess of 100 millimetres here, but tending towards 200 in the long term. And uh, with that program, we can also get settlement profiles. So we can look at any particular section and see how the profile is going. 
And this is where the, uh, the building is at the moment. I was in Doha three or four months ago and uh, it's been another victim, perhaps temporarily, uh, of the financial crisis. It's only gone up to about 10 or 12 stories and it's uh, sitting there. Uh, but the foundations are in, so uh, that's, that's good. The next uh, case I want to describe is a uh, building that uh, is uh, currently under construction, although again it's halted because of financial issues. It's a 600 metre tall Inchon 151 tower, so it's uh, supposed to have 151 storeys. Uh, quite a, a dramatic looking uh, bit of architecture located not very far away from Inchon Airport in, in uh, South Korea. And it's actually, the other thing that's exciting is it's on a reclaimed uh, area of land. So this is what it was like before the reclamation took place. Another challenge is that uh, the, the geological conditions here are, are, are quite complex. There is actually an old fault that runs across here, uh, or certainly a sheared uh, area. And so uh, we have here a site where you cannot have a single geotechnical model for the whole site because of the differences uh, in the geology. So we have actually split this site up into eight sectors and uh, had a different uh, geotechnical model for each of those eight sectors. The model itself, a little more straightforward now, we have uh, marine deposits, then some weathered soil and, and weathered uh, uh, or very weak rock, and then there's a, uh, a deposit that's called soft rock. It's not necessarily that soft, uh, but what's happening is that the foundations are actually going into this weaker rock layer, which typically has unconfined compressive strengths of the order of 4 to 10 megapascals. And this is uh, some of the typical core. It doesn't actually look all that great, but um, uh, the material into which the piles are founded is better than this. The foundation system again is a pile draft, um, 172 piles, larger diameter, two and a half metres, um, and uh, the piles are being founded into that soft rock uh, with a raft thickness now significant of 5.5 metres. <coughs> and this is the foundation layout, uh, just a central part with four legs basically splaying out. Um, the results of the ultimate uh, limit state analysis, we applied reduction factors of 0.64 for the lateral capacity, and that low reduction factor for lateral represents uh, the fact that there's a greater degree of uncertainty because of the soft marine clays uh, than there is with the stiffer deposits <laughs> lower down. But basically, um, um, that foundation system was found to be stable uh, for the ultimate limit state. The cyclic load uh, check again came out okay. This is the, the ratio of the cyclic load to the uh, ultimate shaft resistance for each of the 172 bars, and uh, they were all below the 0.5 limit. And these are the settlement contours, uh, showing also not only the tower, but the outside area where there will be a podium. Maximum settlements of the order of 90 to 100 millimetres. And uh, as part of the output of that program, we can also get uh, the distribution of loads in the piles, and therefore we can get the axial stiffness and the lateral stiffness of each of the piles in the foundation system. Um, that uh, 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 project is currently on hold again. There's been pile load testing carried out which indicated that uh, our design values for shaft friction in the better materials were quite conservative and so if construction does continue uh, then uh, it's likely that we will be able to uh, trim the size of the pile somewhat. I just wanted to uh, very quickly show you some of the other buildings that uh, are on pile graphs. Uh, there's this uh, rather interesting building, 220 metres tall in Doha. This is the iconic um, hotel, the, the Burj Al Arab in Dubai, and this is on a pile graph. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, to be involved in uh, assisting W.S. Atkins uh, in the design of that. Um, 
And uh, there's a very interesting paper that will be presented tomorrow by uh, uh, our, our uh, conference uh, technical leader, uh, uh, Dr. Fung, uh, dealing with the um, uh, International uh, Commerce Centre in, uh, in Kowloon in Hong Kong, uh, 480 plus metres tall. And just to show that um, uh, we don't uh, only restrict ourselves to piles, this is a, a, uh, uh, a raft plus barrettes rather than raft plus piles. A uh, large number of piles, and, and Dr. Fung has done a very nice, complex analysis to look at uh, the, the overall behaviour. And um, this is the sort of thing, uh, as I said before, that you can do once the design has been established by more reasonable methods, you can then check that uh, everything uh, is performing as you would hope. The Burj uh, Dubai, now the Burj Khalifa, is on a pile graft uh, system, uh, currently the world's tallest at 828 metres, and we assisted Haida Consulting in the design of that. We were the geotechnical peer reviewers. Um, and um, measurements of the settlements of this uh, uh, foundation have been made, and as of uh, a couple of years ago, and these are the latest ones I can get, out of the people involved. Professor Polos for very exciting lecture and I think that is very useful for uh, engineer in Vietnam both the geotechnic and instructional engineer because uh, the number both the number and the height of high-rise in Vietnam increased very very considerably during the last decade. Thank you very much and please uh, Mr. Huang <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, so uh, this morning is uh, finished here, so it's time for lunch. Maybe you are waiting for that, uh, many of you. So uh, we have one hour uh, from 12.15 uh, to 13.15. Um, the dining hall is on the fourth floor. You can use the uh, elevator on your left.